This Week on Waterways. Fort Jefferson Preservation Projects in the Dry Tortugas. largest emergent coral reef. Home to the nation's largest nesting colony of sooty terns. Home to the largest all-masonry fort in the United States. The Tortugas. The first recorded visit to the Tortugas was made by Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon in 1513, just 20 years after Columbus set foot in the New World. He called them Las Tortugas, the turtles, for their large population of sea turtles. The word dry was added to the name later to warn mariners that fresh water was in short supply. Located 70 miles west of Key West, Florida, in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, visitors come from all over the world to behold the natural and historical wonders in the sea, in the air. But because more than 99% of the park lies underwater, the feature most visible upon arriving in the Tortugas is Fort Jefferson on Garden Key. So Fort Jefferson, which is the main cultural resource at Dry Tortugas National Park, was constructed over a 30-year period beginning in 1846. While Theodore Roosevelt set aside the islands as a bird refuge in 1908, it wasn't until 1935 that the National Park Service began managing Fort Jefferson. In 1992, it was redesignated as Dry Tortugas National Park to reflect the area's natural as well as cultural features. There are two ways to get to Dry Tortugas National Park, by plane or by boat. Those fortunate few who have the time and motivation to get to Dry Tortugas National Park are transported back in time. So when they step off that boat, they are in awe almost at this visual environment. I mean, here you're, you're standing in front of this massive masonry structure by beautiful crystal clear blue water. There's birds flying, uh, fish jumping. It's really an amazing place. It took hundreds of laborers and three and a half million dollars, that's 500 million in today's dollars, for the 30-year project. And while Fort Jefferson's cannons never fired a shot in battle, the size and design of Fort Jefferson became a deterrent for every foreign aggressor that ever heard reports of this intimidating fortification. It's hard to explain to folks who haven't been here what an amazing place this is, what a pivotal role forts like Fort Jefferson served in American history, the deterrence factor that a fort like Fort Jefferson served during the Civil War, during the Spanish-American War. This is a phenomenal location. Fort Jefferson's design incorporated many of the latest technological advancements. Rainwater was collected and held in cisterns below each gunroom or casemate and iron shutters were installed that were specifically designed to protect cannon crews by opening and closing automatically. It's impossible not to notice the estimated 16 million bricks that cover Fort Jefferson. But less noticeable are the iron shutters. One of the key identifying historical features of Fort Jefferson, the wrought iron Totten shutter assemblies embedded in every lower tier opening. The Totten shutters are named after their inventor, Joseph Gilbert Totten an engineer in the United States Army. The Totten Shutter Assembly was a major technological feat of its day. So the cannonball would fire out of the opening, the doors would recoil shut, the locking pins on the doors would slide up that beveled face and then drop into those two divots within the strike plate. Unfortunately, the Totten Shutters built to protect the fort and the men firing the cannon are gradually destroying the fort. Over the years, the wrought iron has expanded 
The iron's expansion is much more powerful than the strength of the brick and mortar surrounding it. The result? Blowouts, causing bricks to fall from the fort walls into the moat below. Herein lies our conundrum. We have this incredible key feature that is important to the history of the structure. It's important to military technology, yet this same feature is a main aspect that's, that's creating a massive structural issue throughout time. So right now, this is a great example to see the composite results of what happens over the whole stretch of the structure when we cannot get these iron components out. So it starts out with simple expansion and sort of an immediate deterioration of the masonry around the structure. As park employees witnessed major sections of the facade falling into the water, they knew something had to be done. The question was, how would they repair the fort's walls? These types of repairs had never been attempted anywhere in the world. So in the 1980s, the National Park Service entered into uncharted territory and started testing various techniques to repair the walls. When we did the mock-up, our replicated totten shutters were made out of a plastic polymer material. When we went to phase one, we actually found a better material which was called GFRC, which is glass fiber reinforced concrete. And when we, when we made that switch to GFRC, I think we have a much better um, replication of the iron components. It looks more like iron, the color's more true to the iron, and um, overall just a better product. Some of the materials used to build Fort Jefferson came from the vicinity, including coral and sand. Other materials had a much longer journey. Natural cement used in the fort structure came from New York, the bricks were made in Pensacola, Florida, prior to the Civil War. After the war started with Florida standing with the Confederacy, bricks had to be shipped from Maine. The process of stabilizing Fort Jefferson would replace these materials with similar materials. Enola Contracting Services employed 15 men who worked 12 hours a day for 21 days straight. After three weeks of hard work, they would fly home for a week's rest before starting the cycle again. They worked this schedule from November to June for four years. We, we spend hours surveying each, each area, marking brick, just figuring out which ones come out, which ones stay, and then it takes twice as long because we could just wipe this whole wall out in, in hours compared to a whole week to do a section of wall so we can save the historical material. I think the people that worked on this fort in original construction were very proud of this building. This is a structure where form is following function and yet we have incredible masonry going on in here and guys that really put some time and effort and were showing off their craftsmanship. I think you'll see that sense of pride carrying over to the Masons that are working on this project today. It's not every day that you work on a massive military fort from the 19th century in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. The, the masonry is fairly, I mean, fairly sanded masonry out here. It's everything else that's involved. It's the, the distance from, from, from land, it's the difference from a city, how we have to get everything out here, the shifts we have to work, the, the getting manpower out here, that doubles the, the, the workload of the job. What you have here is this is completed phase two work and obviously phase two work in progress. We've removed the original pot and shutters. We've reconstructed the lower tier embrasures. We've stabilized the second tier embrasures. And then we've carried out selective brick replacement at the parapet. On top of that, we've done a repointing campaign that more or less works out to be about 100% of the wall uh, for a complete stabilization of this front. Phase two, the removal of the Totten shutters and the stabilization of most of the fort walls was completed in May 2011. The next phase would stabilize front three and a small section of front two. However, 
there is other work being done that some would say is equally important to the preservation of Fort Jefferson. Aside from this, the park is actually doing a lot of other preservation projects. Some highlights of that are we recently mounted one of the original 15-inch Rodman cannons on a historically accurate carriage which is located on the terraplane level of the fort and that has truly become a highlight of the park experience. The Rodman cannon at Fort Jefferson were manufactured in 1871 and were installed on top of the fort in 1872 and 1873. The 15 inch Rodman fired a solid shot that weighed 450 pounds, or a hollow shell that weighed 350. It could hit a target three miles away, the distance from Fort Jefferson to the Loggerhead Lighthouse. Installed along with the Rodman cannon were smaller 10 inch Parrot guns, manufactured in 1864 and 1865. Of the surviving 25 15-inch Rodman guns, we have six of them here at Fort Jefferson. Of the 13 surviving 10-inch Parrots, we have four. So we have almost a quarter of the surviving guns at this site. In 1900, Fort Jefferson's armaments were sold for scrap. All of the cannons, their carriages, the cannonballs, and tons of equipment were sold, including the 10 largest cannons still present at the fort. Fortunately for us, they couldn't get these large guns down from the top of the fort. Unfortunately, they were able to get the carriages, so the cannon actually lay in the sandy, salty uh, terraplin for over a hundred years. The harsh environment of the dry Tortugas took a toll on the remaining cannon. Large areas of corrosion formed in areas where the cannon sat in contact with sand. The overwhelming size of the cannon a 15-inch Rodman cannon weighs 25 tons in such a remote location on top of Fort Jefferson prevented any real progress on cannon preservation until the 1980s. Help came from the 482nd Civil Engineer Squadron stationed at Homestead Air Reserve Base, who devised a way to lift the huge guns out of the sand and up onto blocks. In addition to lifting the cannon, the 482nd would also play a key role in the National Park Service's plans to mount the large guns. But first, the cannon would need to be conserved. So we put out a request for proposal, and um, that was awarded to Tuckerbert Conservation out of Maine. And their proposal um, was innovative, and they are the ones that really seem to understand it. And so we, in 2007, we came out to treat the first cannon. Standard methods of cannon conservation were not feasible in this remote location, with limited electricity, water, housing, and personnel. Adding to the difficulty was the fact that these 25-ton cannon sat on the terraplin at the top of the fort. You start to think the way NASA thinks, so there's a lot of redundancy. You bring um, not one but two of something you need. You, you try to um, think ahead to what you expect may happen and um, try to cover those areas. In order to treat the exterior of the guns, we needed to take off all of that corrosion and get it back down to bare metal. Actually, and in, in the way that was done was using a garnet abrasive um, to sandblast off all of that corrosion and take it back down to white metal. Once the metal surfaces were exposed, a zinc-rich primer was applied, followed by two coats of a special paint. This state-of-the-art primer and paint system is the same system used on ships and bridges, which, like the cannon at Fort Jefferson, are iron objects exposed to salty marine environments. One of the things that was critical to me in this project is that the conservation that was done to the gun would have as long a maintenance cycle as possible. This is a very labor-intensive process. It's not something that we can do annually, um, particularly with 10 guns. Extending the maintenance cycle was a major factor in the approach used by Ron Harvey and his partner in the project, Jonathan Taggart. The paint system on the outside of the cannon seals out moisture, preventing new corrosion from forming. Treating the inside of the cannon, however, 
presented another challenge. The interior of a Rodman gun, called the bore, is 16 feet long, but only 15 inches in diameter, which made accessing it for treatment difficult. One of the changes, uh, one of the unique things that, that we did with the proposal was suggest um, dealing with the bore in a different way. Inspired by historic tools used to swab out the cannon tube, Taggart and Harvey created their own versions of tools to clean the cannon bores and apply a protective coating inside the guns. Harvey also developed a methodology that he calls the double port system to create a separate microclimate within the bore. After coating the bore, a trough of silica gel was installed behind the inner door, or port, to keep the relative humidity inside the cannon very low. Harvey installed a data logger between the two ports to monitor what was going on inside the cannon. The goal is to keep the cannon dry from the inside out. If the relative humidity stays below 15%, corrosion will not form. By electronically monitoring the internal environment of the cannon, there is no guesswork. Thus far, the team's techniques have proven very successful, and the silica gel is expected to have a maintenance cycle of four to five years. And it allows a park that has limited service, has limited people, to reduce their, their um, preservation practices. Uh, they, they really don't have to do a lot. They just have to monitor, and then when it's time, they change out the silica gel. The conservation treatment of the cannon ensures their long-term preservation, but it does little to help visitors understand how these guns worked or their role in defending the Gulf. Without the missing carriages, that part of the story is hard to understand. It was actually a couple of years ago when we were working towards the Park 75th anniversary that we thought this would be a fantastic gift to the public to be able to, to remount one of these guns for the first time in 110 years, visitors could come out here and see what one of these large guns looks like on a carriage. The technical challenges to mounting one of the 25-ton Rodman guns were immense. In the end, more than 50 people were involved in the mounting project in one way or another. Having a carriage made was the easy part, since the original design drawings still exist at the National Archives. However, the original Rodman gun platforms at Fort Jefferson were only temporary platforms that didn't survive intact, and there were no historical drawings or photographs of them known to exist. To help them understand what needed to be reconstructed, National Park Service archaeologists conducted excavations at the fort to determine the size, shape, and construction details of the original platforms. To reconstruct the platform on top of the fort, Russell relied on the park's longtime partnership with the 482nd Civil Engineers Squadron. Historically, the platform would have been created first and then the gun brought to the top of the fort. But with the 25-ton cannon already in place, the 482nd had to devise a phased approach to building the platform, an approach that would construct the platform around the existing cannon. Perhaps the greatest challenge, however, was how to lift the cannon. Because of Fort Jefferson's location and structural design, using a modern crane was not an option. Fortunately, Nancy Russell had been scouring the archives and historic references for any information on the fort's artillery. She came running back from the archive and saying, look, look, I found the artillery manual from the Civil War, and they have pictures in it of the devices they used to move these cannons. There was a, a, a sledge or a cradle, which the cannon would rest in, and then would be on rollers, and then would roll on this plank highway, and that's how they moved them. And I said, Nancy, that's what we need to do. That's how we should move it. Using the historic references as inspiration, Taggart and his team redesigned the historic tools used to move the cannon, once again creating modern versions of the tools used almost 150 years earlier. The same basic principles and equipment were used, but materials and methods were brought into the 21st century to improve safety and reduce labor. We did exactly what they did in the Civil War, was we built a plank highway, we actually put some steel on top of it. They would have used rollers just uh, pipe rollers or 
log rollers to roll. That We thought that was a little scary, so we actually used modern machine removers. And two come-alongs, and we were able to just pull, two people pulling on the come-alongs. We had one person on the backside to act as a brake, just in case it decided to, to, t to run away on us. Records indicate that it took 50 privates and two officers working in two teams to lift a 25-ton Rodman cannon up to the top of the fort. Once there, a team of 12 was needed to move the gun into position. Russell, Harvey, and Taggart had far fewer personnel. Only two men were needed to pull the cannon onto the platform for lifting. Once it was on the platform, a single man moved the 25-ton cannon backwards into position. The cannon then needed to be lifted and held seven and a half feet in the air so that the carriage could be constructed underneath it. Here again, history proved invaluable. Historically, installing the cannon on their carriages was always difficult and dangerous work. In the late 1870s, a man named Theodore Laidley invented a gun lift to aid in mounting and dismounting 15-inch Rodman guns. Although Laidley's gun lift was invented after the Fort Jefferson guns were mounted in 1873, it presented the safest option for doing the work today. It took Russell months to find the design drawing for Laidley's gun lift, eventually locating them with the help of the Smithsonian's library staff. The Laidley gun lift's design was improved upon by Taggart and his team, and the cannon was safely lifted. <laughs> So we had an engineered design following the Laidley gun lift, which was originally in wood. They would have lifted it with chains. We lifted it with uh, Dacron lifting slings and hydraulic jacks. We, we were surprised to find that during the Civil War that they actually used hydraulic jacks to move these things. Now that the cannon was raised, a new crew came in to build the carriage underneath it. The carriage is constructed from stainless steel to ensure its long-term preservation in the harsh marine climate. The three-man team hoisted the individual parts of the carriage, some of which weighed in excess of 1,000 pounds, up to the top of the fort and assembled it under the cannon. Once the carriage was complete, the cannon was gently lowered. Visitors to Dry Tortugas National Park today we'll see a Fort Jefferson that hasn't been seen in over 100 years, and one vastly improved over just five or 10 years ago. The fort's walls are being repaired, and the appearance of the Totten shutters restored. The cannon are being treated and maintained. The military deterrent that the guns represented is visible as the mountain Rodman guns aim over the fort's walls, a warning to approaching ships, which today, carry visitors. Now having this, just this one gun mounted, people come up and suddenly they get it. They really understand what it was about, how it was meant to be used. They're asking all kinds of questions about what it took to man that gun, to service the gun, how far it could shoot. They really are starting to really get interested in it, whereas before it was very much an inanimate object. Now through the mounting process, they really get it. The National Park Service and its partners continue to work to preserve the cannon at Fort Jefferson. As of March 2012, eight of the 10 large guns have received conservation treatment. Mounting all 10 cannon on reproductive carriages is very expensive, but the need to preserve the guns and improve the visitor experience at the park continues. The 482nd Civil Engineer Squadron continues to make platforms to mount the remaining Rodman guns. By the end of 2014, the park expects to have all 10 guns conserved and six of the guns mounted. After the Rodmans are completed, Nancy Russell and her team hope to get funding to tackle mounting the smaller parrot guns. Nancy got the bee under her bonnet seven years ago to make this happen. And today, and behind me, you see the results. Um, it's, it's humbling, it's exciting, and it's also rewarding to be part of a team that brought about this vision. We have something really special here. We have a marriage of cultural and natural resources that may or may not exist anywhere else in the Park Service. With that, I think it's essential that we do what we can to preserve this structure. 
A wise man once said, a civilization can be judged by how it treats its cultural heritage. One day, our generation may be judged positively by how we treated and preserved Fort Jefferson. <laughs>